We're going to call the meeting to order. It's, uh, uh, should we have a roll call? Where's Susan, though? Okay. Yeah, there. Here. Francisco? Here. 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 Okay. Um, is there any public comment on anything not on the agenda? Seeing none. And uh, I should I should just turn this over to you. No. <laughs> Anytime, you know, feel free to jump in. Okay? okay thank you. Um, number one, you want to read that for us, Susan? Some okay. We'll do number one, which is review of major priorities, major workload priorities. Ms. Weiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good afternoon, City Council and Planning Commission. We're happy to be here at our semi-annual workload review with the Council and Planning Commission. And uh, for today's meeting, we have three uh, general topic areas to cover. Uh, the first being a review of major workload items and a bit of an overview for the four programs in the Planning Division other than the long-range planning program. At uh, many of these work sessions, we have an opportunity to focus on the Plan Santa Barbara and major planning issues, which, again, today we do have one related to regional housing needs. But we first wanted to cover a few um, topic areas in the other, division, other programs in the planning division. And it's a good opportunity to check in with you all on uh, active priorities as well as our standard long list of other important things that are in an inactive um, status. Also, the second item for today is um, a brief discussion regarding the land development team fees. This is a discussion item that comes up each time we go into the budget cycle, and we wanted to take an opportunity to have a bit of a broader policy level discussion about land development fees outside of a um, a decision-making point. There's no decision being made today, but we'd like to discuss it a bit with you all. And then the third item is the regional housing um, needs uh, allocation. And Liz Limon will be joining us for uh, that discussion as she's been uh, a lead city representative with the SBCAG and this RENA process. So I'll be going over the first two items, uh, beginning with design review and historic preservation section zoning enforcement and information, development review, and our new section, staff hearing officer environmental review and training. Okay. So beginning with design review, uh, the big news is we have a new board. That's the single family design board and they got to work right away. I think within a week of their establishment, they were sitting down and looking at single family projects and using the new guidelines and findings. Um, I think you're all aware that as part of the update of the Neighborhood Preservation Ordinance, there is a two-year review going on, at which time we'll go back to um, the council with a report on whether or not um, we think there should be any adjustments in the ordinance, guidelines, or program as a whole. Uh, but again, being that this is something new and a new board, it's a, a continual learning process. Every week, different things are coming up, and to the degree that we're able to just make those adjustments as we go along, uh, that is happening. Um, so a lot of good work there. And again, with the NPO implementation, as well as the regular workload in design review with the architectural board review uh, meeting every other Monday now, um, and the Historic Landmarks Commission, the staff is looking at different ways of managing that uh, process. We would like to be, um, we'd like to believe that our handouts and application requirements are helpful to the process overall, but we actually have been finding uh, some negative feedback. You know, either we're asking for too much information, and so applicants are being stalled out at the front end and not being able to come forward, or the board members are feeling that we haven't asked for enough information, and so that's a constant um, struggle. One idea to, again, manage this process is looking at appointments, intake appointments. Uh, so staff has begun that in a couple different areas, and we'd like to expand somewhat of a pilot program before it becomes 
a process requirement uh, to look at appointments, but you may end up hearing about that in the months to come, so I wanted you to know about it. Also, the agenda time. That continues to be a concern. Um, the board and commissioners are concerned about long meetings, as well as, to some degree, their backlog of the agenda. The, if the meetings are shortened, then there can be an agenda backlog. Um, in the last few weeks, Jaime Limon and, and the Architectural Board of Review, they decided to have a special meeting on a Tuesday to try to deal with the backlog. And so we're hopeful that one or two special meetings and uh, perhaps appointments and these various things that we can um, better manage the weekly design review uh, meeting process. That really does take up a substantial amount of time in this work group. And then, of course, that affects the few other things that I want to mention. Um, next is the project re review criteria, um, otherwise known as compatibility findings and that discussion, which has now really morphed into um, a focus on improving communication. That's the broad issue that we're, we're really hoping to uh, improve amongst the design review boards and the land use decision-making bodies, be it the Planning Commission, Staff Hearing Officer, or Council. So design review criteria or findings, uh, that subject has been discussed at um, ABR and HLC meetings and then at the Ordinance Committee. And there, was, there has been good discussion to date, and again, what people <coughs> across the board, members of the community that are concerned about the process, board members themselves, Planning Commission, have focused on the need to improve communication. And now we, too, do want to look at what are we communicating on, what subjects. <laughs> Does a finding about neighborhood compatibility, is that the proper means to um, express opinions about the building's height, neighborhood compatibility? What should that finding say? Um, should the board and commission go through all nine of these subject areas? How will the staff support the board in the meeting? and with the applicant and the community in these design review meetings to work through projects and have a, a motion or set of comments that go forward with the project. So we are um, working with the city attorney. Um, what's pending on that is to return to the ordinance committee. That would be the next step. At the end of the ordinance committee meeting, I was asking, could we just go to council? And I think the ordinance committee wanted to see the ordinance itself. We had only presented the concept and, and hasn't been drafted into ordinance form. So we will be returning to the ordinance committee and then to council to have these adopted. However, um, the concept has already taken foot <laughs> and the uh, chairs of both the HLC and the ABR, which sometimes they're in attendance here, but I don't see them today, um, are you know, using that list of the nine key topics already. I know that commission liaisons have been attending the meetings and wanting to communicate more about concerns that'll be coming down the, the pipe with the projects. So uh, work is already being done now, but we would like to run it all the way through and have a formal ordinance direction on um, how to communicate between the design review and land use um, decision making. Then in your staff report, I ha we have an attachment, again, for each one of these uh, programs. And for the design review group, we did include a list of pending guideline updates. Any problem can be solved with good guidelines. And um, <laughs> that's what I think Council Member Francisco wanted, <coughs> the pumpkin patch guidelines last time we, we met. Um, so that's an inside joke, but I think <laughs> Some of you know. Okay, so the list of guidelines that we've identified uh, so far pending is there are a few areas in the Chapala Street design guidelines, uh, Jaime indicated possibly doing an addendum. There's the sign ordinance and sign guideline update that's very much of interest. Uh, wireless facilities and antennas. There's the Outer State Street design guidelines multiple family design guidelines, as well as Haley Milpas guidelines. And those three last sets really, um, I believe, are closely tied to broader planning issues and really may be more appropriate for post-plan um, Santa Barbara. And also, given the, the workload that we have going on right now and budgetary considerations and such, it's really not very likely that we would be um, jumping 
right into all of these kind of area guidelines like Haley Milpas or new multiple family design guidelines um, just yet. So we do keep a running list and in fact at one point I thought we would be adding to that list today. There's been some discussion with people in the Coast Village Road area and at with a few council people, they had indicated the interest of having design guidelines. Well, as we've discussed with them what their concerns are, it's really, again, much broader than just a design guideline concern. So um, they did not submit a request to be have that item discussed or anything today. Um, but that is, again, my point about any good problem, good guidelines might be your solution. But I'm really partly joking there because there are major policy considerations that really sh need to be hashed out first before you match the details of design um, to carry forward city goals. So the last area that I want to talk about in this program is the Historic Resources Work Program. There is quite a bit of good work that we could be doing more of in the community, uh, working with the Historic Landmarks Commission, the Council, property owners throughout the community and interested residents and interest groups in the area of uh, historic resources work program. And so we wanted to um, return to city council at a focused discussion just on the historic resources work program at some point. Um, at times in the past, uh, really better budget times, there was a time when there was a healthy sum of money allocated to really move forward with surveys. Um, we're still um, working through some of the surveys that were started with those funds, and that's the Lower Riviera Survey and the Waterfront Area Survey. So to some degree, money itself is just doesn't get the job, the job completely done, and a lot of what is um, needed is time and just people's resources and effort. And in the Design Review and Historic Work Program section, as I mentioned, having these three boards and commissions and all of the application intake and review and meeting time does not really allow a lot of time for these broader, important um, sort of historic uh, long-range planning type of uh, efforts and designations and such. So we want to take the opportunity to to look in more depth with the council on that. I just wanted to foreshadow that that would be coming. We'll be looking at the surveys that are still um, slowly making their way, progress towards, ultimately towards the council to, to, with recommendations from the Historic Landmarks Commission on new historic districts, new guidelines, new ordinances to, to deal with historic dis districting plans. That's one element. We are also still working on the Mills Act um, implementation and the Ordinance Committee will be seeing that again soon. It is now coming up on the calendar to return to Ordinance Committee with the Mills Act. Um, and then designations. The Historic Landmarks Commission has a designation subcommittee and they do put in good time and effort in that regard and yet they seem to stall out between the committee, the property owner and the staff. There's enough players that these designations aren't happening at the, the rate and, and frequency that, that I think people would like to see. So we will be returning to the, plant, to the um, City Council along with the HLC for more discussion of that um, sometime within the next several months. It's not scheduled at the moment. Okay. The next section I wanted to highlight is the zoning program. And in the enforcement realm, there's quite a bit of activity. There's the a new uh, focus, which has been great, on trees and landscaping. We've been able to make use of an hourly staff position to roll up her sleeves and get out in the field and look at trees and landscaping issues, as well as the city administrator's office has formed an interdepartmental team looking at uh, landscaping and enforcement issues. Signs, uh, we've had some discussions with the sign committee and a number of, of people in the community and on the boards. Um, and there were a lot of good ideas to address signs. Uh, one idea was to just have better PR and promote um, what the signs are about. So I hope you all saw the Channel 18 piece that was done. When you have a good idea, you call Channel 18 staff and next thing you know, it's on. And so that was really exciting and great. Uh, there's still certainly more we can do in signs. And I mentioned looking at the ordinance as well as the guidelines is something that we'd like to do. 
there are a variety of land use violations and um, some of them are are quite interesting. Um, the whole <laughs> phenomena of um, what do you call it? Home vacation rentals. That's that's one that's difficult. Um, the the trend towards people working at home um, and different issues that happen there, whether or not the work is compatible with the residential area or incompatible. We've been finding more of those type of complaints and concerns. Our staff is involved in the Neighborhood Improvement Task Force and from time to time, we, again, we work as a team. They haven't identified any major zoning as like the lead project in the NITF, but we're part of the team and primed and ready to do that. Um, so I expect there'll be more. We were heavily involved in the um, the waterfront area property where there was storage and trailers and also the West Arriaga property. Overall, an interest in having more outreach and improvements in what we do in enforcement is, is something, you know, that's on our mind daily. Uh, this program has taken on the sign committee staff support rather than the design review staff who Jaime's staff would do ABR, HLC, and signs. Now we've shifted it to zoning, and that provides a closer connection between the sign committee and enforcement because there were communication um, dropouts, you know, and so now it's more closely linked. Also, that gives Jaime a chance to manage the three committees that he has <laughs> and not four. Um, this team also is the lead administrative support to the staff hearing officer. Danny Cato um, oversees the agenda and the noticing and, and the program as a whole. Um, and then his staff is the, the staff on all the modification requests. At the staff hearing officer, the case planners under development review handle the condominiums and coastal permits, but all the modifications are still handled by the zoning staff. Other functions are plan checks, zoning information reports, at counter, and we are um, very much involved, the staff in zoning, regarding the technology permit tracking within our own department as well as citywide issues. Something of interest I'm sure to you all is what is going on with zoning ordinance amendments. Um, we're working very hard on what has been called round one. Round one <laughs> implies that there would be subsequent rounds. Um, however, I, I must report that this has taken a very, very long time to work through round one. And um, we're very excited about the threshold milestone that we met with the ordinance committee, uh, I think March 18th. Um, where we've completed the conceptual discussion of all the key areas and now we are um, working with the city attorney's office on the actual drafting of the ordinance to bring the ordinance language back to the ordinance committee and then from there it would go to city council for an introduction hearing and adoption. And there has been quite a bit of discussion along the way with this package which is far ranging from the various topic areas. So there's still a lot of work to do in round one, but we have, we have made some very good progress. Also what has happened is the staff, the lead staff on that project has been, um, the position was shifted out of zoning and used to create a new position. So Susan Reardon is uh, one of the job share supervisors in our new section, and the zoning section lost to half of position that was doing zoning ordinance amendment work. So um, in reality, the concept of round two and all these other topics, um, they have an inactive status. They're not assigned to be coming up or going to anyone in particular in the division right now. Um, so unfortunately, what is happening is, you know, the list tends to grow. Um, but uh, we are going to be working with the city attorney, as I said, through this round one. Um, it may be that we can, while we're doing all this effort, start to move along on one or two topics. It might not be a round of, or package of things, but where we have the opportunity and we can focus some attention, we'd like to continue to amend the municipal code, be it the sign ordinance, um, parking ordinance, or, or different zoning situations but the major assignment is coming, uh, will be coming to a close on the round one. Development review, we um, included a list of the major projects that are pending before uh, the Planning Commission right now, and of note certainly is this is probably 
uh, the highest volume of environmental impact reports that we have had in some time. The environmental review process that the city uses um, really starts actively right at the lowest level with our master environmental assessment and special studies. And we, we do make good use of categorical exemptions after having really considered different issues. Then, of course, um, when a negative declaration is appropriate, we'll use a negative declaration. Just given the nature of some of these pending projects, um, their location and such, we actually are, are doing a couple, um, quite a few EIRs. Um, so I'm not going to go through each project um, on this list. I just the, the comments that I wanted to make are regarding the number of EIRs, the number of major projects, as well as just the number of projects overall. Again, um, the uh, workload in the land development team and development review um, remains high and complicated, yet there is also a slowing down, in the general slowdown in the economy. We have seen some reduction in um, permit applications, but those folks that are still going through tend to still take a fair amount of time themselves to be going through. Um, so the review challenges beyond the workload as a whole um, that this section um, in work is facing and the Planning Commission and others can talk about it. Again, wanting to improve the communication between the review boards and also just times of shifting policy. And who is setting these policies? You know, it's like, um, are people aware and understand the policy basis from which uh, we're acting? And when you do understand that, sometimes there are competing goals and interests. And in ideas that were developed 15 years ago, you know, being looked at freshly today um, can make it quite difficult um, for policy decision makers. And so we have seen that in a number of the projects at the Planning Commission, and you all can, can attest to that yourselves. Um, also, I just want to make a note that we are looking at a retirement um, from Jan Hubble, a longtime dedicated city employee uh, who has been leading the development review section now for the past seven years, eight years, quite some time. But uh, I think it's, this will be a 30-year career <laughs> with the city. And so um, there's no replacing someone like Jan at all. Okay. But what we're looking to do is work closely with Jan and share her wealth of knowledge and experience and looking at different promotional opportunities and ways to cross-train and overfill that position so that this transition between now and um, September 8th, 26th, oh good, September 26th, okay. Every day that I can get uh, makes me happy. So anyway, but um, she, this, she may not be here for your next semi-annual uh, meeting. And so we'll, we may be talking about that transition plan at, at your next meeting. Okay, I think I was just going to run into the second item. I had asked the mayor yeah, if we could ahead. just present the first two items together and then have the public comment mm -hmm. and then Liz will join us for the arena. Okay. So um, unless you would like to stop and ask questions about the programs. Um, Madam yeah, Mayor, I think we're fine. More? I think we're fine. Okay, go I can just go we'll into the land development. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It won't take that long. Okay, um, what we wanted to um, talk just a little bit about regarding land development team or LDT fees is um, several years back now, we took the time with the staff throughout the land development team, and that includes the community development department, planning and building and safety staff the fire prevention staff in the fire department. And within public works, it includes the land development team engineering section and the transportation planning section, but also includes other facets of the public works department, say the water resources or streets um, operations sometimes get involved in land development also. So we did a study of our time and effort in different development application types. And what we found was that over time, uh, as our process became more team-oriented, more complicated dealing with different projects, uh, you know, we do spend an awful lot of time both at the staff level and through the review bodies. And so uh, the recovery, the amount of recovery that say someone came in for a four-lot subdivision and paid $800, that might have been 6% of the cost of processing 
a subdivision. And so in discussing this with the Planning Commission, Design Review Boards, and the Council, a target of 30 percent recovery was set for a certain group of land development team applications. Um, again, this is a subject that we talk about regularly in the budget cycle. And this 30 percent recovery target is not an across the board. There are a number of um, programs. The design review application process actually recovers um, closer to about 60 percent of the costs there. The zoning and information reports that the city does is very close to cost recovery. Our mailing label. So I just want to give you a sense that some programs and services are higher, but this group of land development team type of applications, the subdivisions, conditional use permits, coastal development permits, annexations, the environmental review, those type of projects was where we set the 30 percent goal. And um, this 30 percent recovery um, is something that is also shared um, each division. There's a, an accounting that the finance department does that gives back the funding to the different um, the different divisions and departments as well. So what we have found in the course of obtaining the 30 percent recovery, which is, is pretty much where we are right now, we have been for the last year or two, um, is we did a fairly substantial ratcheting up of the fees in the land development team. And so someone coming in now for a subdivision, I, I didn't bring it with me, but you know they're paying um, several thousand dollars in order to propose the four lot subdivision. And when you compare that fee to other um, jurisdictions within the area, um, it's, sometimes it's like comparing apples to oranges because other agencies require full cost recovery. And then some agencies also set a fee at what they just generally believe to be a reasonable rate. So we have uh, reached and maybe are beginning to surpass those that set a fee at what they believe to be a reasonable rate. Um, and I think if the city of Santa Barbara was to have a full cost recovery, it would really be um, a major concern and probably not workable. And the reason I say that is because the amount of time that this organization, this community puts into the review of projects is really so great. There, the philosophy behind this has been that there's a benefit of that to the general community. Therefore, it's appropriate to have the general fund subsidize some of these planning processes, and we'd like to see the land development team fees um, recovering costs. It shouldn't be a complete subsidy to an applicant. An applicant should pay a fair amount to go through the process, but there is a trade-off of um, cost and benefit. Um, this comes up again every year, and when there are years with tighter budgets, the um, consideration gets a little tighter and hotter about whether or not this 30 percent recovery is the right percent. In fact, at the last year's budget presentation for the City Council, a few of you mentioned, well, maybe we should look at 50 percent or a different uh, a percent recovery. Uh, one concern and consideration I certainly have about that is, generally speaking, when people think about raising a fee for service, a cost, they also think about increasing the service that would go along with that. And really, this is being looked at from a management standpoint from a, a very different perspective. It's that these fees for service are going up so we can maintain the levels of service that we have now and so we can propose budgets where no planning positions or transportation or engineering folks are being cut from the budget. So um, in order to really consider going up to a 50 percent as a new target, we wanted to have some just initial thoughts and discussions about what would the approach be for that. Uh, we definitely need to talk with people more about it. Should we go and do, we would probably need to do again more time, time studies as to, you know, refresh our um, information on what the costs are talk with different applicants um, before really uh, taking on a uh, new target is 50 percent. At least that's where the staff is coming from because we're the ones that would be communicating this to people on a daily basis. But we want to have this discussion with you because people also will call a council person or complain at a planning commission meeting or something if they feel that the costs have been unreasonable. So this is, a, we feel, is another great opportunity to have some feedback and discussion from. Council and the Commission. So 
that's a, certainly a subject for feedback and um, discussion. As far as the, um, the overview of the programs, I don't have any particular question to ask. Um, I think we have the priorities aligned with what the, the regular communication we've had from the council are, and we do um, you know, manage the daily activities along with the desire to improve systems and ordinances at the same time. But we certainly welcome um, any questions or feedback you'd like to give us on any of the, the programs. Oh, and I'm sorry, I, I made an oversight. I just briefly mentioned the um, new program, the staff uh, hearing officer, environmental review and training. And again, this was a new program instituted this fiscal year. So several months ago, you heard a presentation about the creation of this new program. And I am quite excited and looking forward to um, the work that they're doing, which includes transitioning out of the zoning ordinance package that's been still an ongoing thing, even though we have a new position, we're still holding on to that work, as well as transitioning out of the role, Deborah Andaloro, as the, the environmental analyst, has now hired a replacement environmental analyst, and she's supervising uh, both the capital program environmental reviews and the, the private projects environmental reviews. And then um, Ms. Reardon is working with me as well to be um, transitioning into the role of the staff hearing officer. Our, our transition plan called for that to happen um, beginning of this fiscal year. So she's going to start, start to share meeting and decision making time with me as the staff hearing officer. Um, so that would be effective July or so. And um, training as a whole, uh, again, there's quite a bit of work we can do with our, our own internal policies and procedures and handouts and uh, the staff is committed through the P3 program to hold at least 30 training sessions this year. So um, we're very serious about that and it really helps people um, understand the important work we do and feel more uh, rewarding about it when we're better trained and have the tools. So uh, that concludes this part of the report. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, we should have some public comment if there is any, but uh, it's to this board and, and commission. Um, Das, did you want to, do you have a question? Let Paula go first. You're it. You can come up. Yeah, right there, Paula. Thank you. People are first. Uh -huh. people are there. I know the people are there. Okay, Paula I'm Westbury, sorry. go ahead. My name is Paula Westbury. I um, wrote a bit. I tried to read as best possible. It's a little hard to respond to all the things that are on the pending list because they're really disastrous. Anyway, let's we'll start with never demolish, always preserve, be well. The city is good. Never destroy the city. Okay. Public health issues are. Be well. The public issues are a major concern. Don't overcrowd. Don't build. Be well. The Native American people live here in the ethereal field. That is their heaven. Never tear down a building. Never demolish. Never excavate. Got it? This is the overview of Santa Barbara. Some people have never heard of this, but many people have heard it before. Native American land is all around you. The Chumash babies are there helping all to be well. Never excavate. Save the land, save the water, never excavate. The burial grounds are everywhere. Ceremonial sites are all around. Never ever tear down the town. Preserve the town. Everybody wants to preserve the town. Remember, preserve the town. It is necessary. Don't tear it down. Save all the buildings. They are stronger than the newest ones that are planned. The newest ones are mostly to an earthquake. That is not very good. The old ones went through the 1925 earthquake, they made it, the older ones, they made it and they were, and others were, re, they were rebuilt and they recycled everything in those days. And so the things built around them are very, very, very strong. People learned from experience. All the buildings that went through the 1925 earthquake should be safeguarded. Don't wait for the survey to, t don't demolish Santa Barbara at all. Don't wait for the surveys to save historic Santa Barbara. You've got to save them immediately, especially my childhood house, especially 222 West Alamar. They're big, giant trees, okay, made into 
to houses here. Don't tear them down. They're historically significant on a grand scale. They are safe. Save every house. Save every driveway as it still exists. Save open space. That's important. Don't build the condos. They have cement, not yards. It's extraordinary. What I learned just by trying to save my childhood house, the whole thing is going to be cement with a little three-foot yard, which is not exactly healthy for anybody. Okay? Remember that. They have, anyway, the drive, it's driveways, not yards. Avoid overcrowding, no cinder block, overwhelming. All these condos are overwhelming to the one-story neighborhoods which need preservation. Preserve the bungalow areas, preserve all of Santa Barbara, don't tear it down. You have to do it immediately so nothing goes down at all. It's necessary, be well. Save all the old growth redwood tree houses, garages, fences, carports, etc. Thousands of years, the, uh, the wood is thousands of years old. We have it up to 30,000 in Santa Barbara. From the burl, the redwood burl, we were 10,000 year old tree goes up and we have them all over the old district. Most of the flat area has it. All the old buildings has it. You should save everything. And the newer houses you should save too. Don't lose any houses. Anyway, these, these are our national heritage, these old growth redwood tree houses. They are safe and solid. Save the yards. Don't expand the houses. Don't expand into the yards because you have to tear the houses apart to expand into the yards. Don't go up. Don't go out. Just don't mess up those yards. They're really special. They're full of Indians making everybody well. Don't tear down Santa Barbara. It's historic. It is scenic. Never let it go. Enough building. Save the town from demolition. Let's have historic preservation. Actually preserve everything. Let's have environmental review that actually saves Santa Barbara. Thank Be you. well. Thank and you. It's really important to do it immediately because you shouldn't ever, ever tear down Santa Barbara in the first place. I finished my page. I actually got it. I have another page of just information. Oh. I'll give okay. But it's really important to do it immediately because everything that's built in this long list of, of pending things are really disastrous because every time you build something, you've got to tear down Santa Barbara. You shouldn't tear down anything at okay. all. Okay? Thank okay. you very, very much. You're all very wonderful. I'm sorry you have to work so hard, but if you really preserve, there's a lot less work to do. Okay? okay? Thank you. You just leave it the way it is. Thank you. Okay. It's to the com on what she did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Callum, you can go right up there. Callum DeForest. Good afternoon. I'm Callum DeForest, and uh, thank you for this presentation and the, the subjects that are being discussed. I I want to bring up a problem, and i not completely addressed here, uh, with the length of time projects take from when some kind of preliminary uh, review, some kind of preliminary plan has been accepted, uh, design has been accepted, and the length and the uh, time it takes for that to for the designers, the developers to get around to showing the completed plans and sometimes this comes as a complete surprise and I would like to see a tightening of that time frame so that Developers can't, I know there's lots of things that they have to do, can't sit on a project, get a sort of a preliminary approval, then sit on a project for two or three years, and then suddenly bring it forth. I know they have, they have a problem with financing and other, other problems, but sometimes these giant projects suddenly get <coughs> thrust upon us and we, we are very surprised. Um, there, and this uh, list here is very helpful because I don't know whether the general public uh, is fully aware what the Whole Foods wants to do on that or that project there where the, uh, Circuit City is now or across the street where the Sandman is. I these huge projects. I don't know whether all those people out there on the upper west side are aware of what 
is proposed, and when suddenly it comes up as a fait accompli, they're going to hit the ceiling. So there does need to be a better way of, of handling that process. And this is especially true with projects that come forth and they have a the architect makes a beautiful uh, beautiful renderings, but they sort of leave out what's around them. But I know you are working on that. That but certainly when they first come to you they really have to show how their project is going to impact on the neighborhood. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Any others? Okay, Mr. Williams. Well, I hadn't planned on commenting on it, but I, I thought that Mr. DeForest's uh, point is well taken. I Part of it's, I suppose, a, a sense of self-preservation. I, I mean, I, I it, for me, it's kind of difficult to to deal with the fact that people sometimes, I, I'm thinking of one project in particular, that's taking so long that, that I might be an old man. So maybe if I'm no longer in office by the time it's built, um, then that won't be a problem. But it, if things take five or seven years after approval to, to be built, um, you can be, people go, well, how did you let that go? And I, you go, well, that was actually before I even um, thought of running for public office, let alone in public office. And, and, and I guess the question would be, is there also a nexus to cost? Because if you recover, if we set an expiration of permits that was less than perhaps, you know, if a project didn't do their due diligence, um, uh, then um, you would have another set of fees when they resubmit um, uh, a new uh, a new or revised project. So I guess that's more of a question than and a comment. Well, the question, um, the question. Do you want that answered first? Sure. Is, okay. is, is but the question has to do with um, whether you can set a quicker schedule than by state law, because the state law has a certain number of months and I, years and so on. I guess the question would be. Are are is the expirations just wholly a product of state law, yeah. or in some cases, and what are would, they, could we do about that they, if we wanted uh, to? The um, application processing timeframes are a combination of local standards and state law. Um, the city has uh, adopted a standard through our development application review process that if an application sits dormant for, I think it's 120 days, then it could be deemed um, withdrawn and inactive and that you would need to pay uh, fees again. That determination you can, I think, appeal to the community development director. Jan, do you want to answer this? Why don't you come to the main? Okay. Um, a whole lot better if Jan answers this yeah. question. But um, I did want to comment just on fees, though. Um, the well, Jan, if you would address that too, <laughs> there you go. So that would be best. <laughs> Thank you. So we can't. We're not going to be able to replace her. Thank you, mm -hmm. Madam Mayor and, and Council and Commissioners. Um, we do. We do try to encourage people to come back in within 120 days. Although I will be honest, with the amount of work that's going through the process right now, we are not unduly upset if somebody takes longer. You know, we, we have a complex process. We have a pre-application review, and then we have development application review, which is the formal submittal. And we have to make a determination when, it, when that comes in that it's complete or incomplete within 30 days of receiving that application. Most of the time on its first attempt, it is incomplete there, because there are just so many things. I think the... I think once in all the time that I've been doing this, I can recall that we actually ended up with something that was conditionally complete on the first review round. Uh, most take a couple of times through the process just to get to the point of being complete. And sometimes we ask for pretty extensive special studies. We need geotechnical reports. We need biological reports, noise studies, um, all kinds of things, and those often take more than 120 days. If we don't hear anything within a year, they're, they're really more considered to be withdrawn. But we do have a couple of projects that are on seventh or ninth darts. 
because they are complicated projects, there are lots of concerns, and a couple of these projects have taken so long to get to the point of being complete that they've had new, new things apply to them, like the whole stormwater management plan is a really good example. Um, so it, it does take a while to get complete, and then we are, with the exception of those projects that require some kind of legislative action by the council, such as an annexation or a rezone or a general plan amendment, we have, but for the rest of those, we do have timelines that we're supposed to work within under the Permit Streamlining Act. And if it's a project that has an exemption, then we're, we've got 30 plus 60 days to get this to the Planning Commission for a decision or to the staff hearing officer. With a negative declaration, we have 180 days for an EIR. We've got a, a year to complete and certify the EIR, and then another another period of time, about 90 days or so, to get to the approve or deny the project itself. We try to keep those tracking together. It makes more sense usually to certify the, pro the certify or approve the, ne the negative declaration or the EIR on the same day that we consider the project itself. But we do have some leeway in doing that, especially for a significant project that requires changes to the project once the EIR is complete to come back to the commission. And then the fees. <laughs> and let me, let me maybe third add a, dart. Yes, we do. Let me add, add a, a, we, a permutation. It could 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 we set a set condi And I know we are doing this a little bit, but could we set more stringent conditions of approval of several milestones in construction, for instance, that at one point, at some point, if um, the applicant or the applicant's successor or the successor to the successor of the applicant is not doing due diligence that their permits would be revoked. You know, I'll talk a little bit. Let me finish up in the fee piece, and then I'll come back to that, too. The, we do, for projects that have a third DART, we you charge got, I, fees. I guess I guess you'd all know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, you know, we do charge we do charge additional fees if people go into a third plus DART, and it's a, it's half, or no, it's quarter of the highest fee that they paid as part of their original submittal. But we are losing something in there. For projects that take a long time to get to the point of being complete, the fees have gone up around them over time, and yet they are still being pegged on the fees yeah. that they that they paid when they initially came in. Yeah. So there's maybe something that would be an incentive is that if they take too long a time, then we at least pick up the adjusted fees, the net increase that's occurred since they originally paid their fees. That would be another possibility. On the other end, once a project is approved, a lot of that does have to do with state deadlines. You know, a subdivision map is good for two years, and they are allowed up to three, one year, or actually they could even do a three-year extension. So they're allowed five years total once they're approved. Um, part of that has to do with you know, and at one time, modifications were only good for a year, and we upped it to two years. And the reality is, is we were doing time extensions for almost every single modification because it takes time to finish with the design review process, get your building permit, and get your financing. So a year really isn't enough. Two years is barely minimal in some cases, and when you end up with a with a little bit of a sneaky economy like we have right now, we do have people who are beginning to say, you know, I need to extend my approval so that I can wait a little bit longer to start the construction because the economy has slowed down and I can't do it right now. So, and then once, once the building permit is issued, then they're good for 180 days or six months. They can get, they can get an extension. And I know the new code sets some additional language on how those extensions mm -hmm. work. And then, of course, there are projects that we deliberately allow a whole lot longer, and the Fess Parker project being one of those where we did a development agreement that gave them a lot more time to construct, but in exchange for giving us the property for the park and completing a number of public improvements. So, complicated. I just want to mm -hmm. quickly add a 
another comment on the fees. Just since we're talking about land development fees, wanted to refresh your memory that last year we created a new land development team fee, and we called it the recovery fee. So when people come in now, after they've paid their planning commission and ABR, and then they prepare their working drawings and they go and get the building permit, we collect a fee that we called it recovery at that later date. It's called uh, it's a 30 percent of your original application fees. So the same point that Jan was making about what are you paying any increase in fees that you collect as projects over the life of the projects. Our approach uh, when we instituted this fee, um, and I think some of you will recall talking about that, was 30 percent of the original application fee. So. We also charge a certain amount if people revise their project halfway through the review process. That's another opportunity to collect fees. But overall, it's not, it's not with a heavy hand. We, we often give people relief if they ask for it for these additional fees. They can appeal the decision that they're incomplete to the community development director, et cetera. So there's the recovery fee, revised project, third DART, and the original application fees. So I just, Madam that's Mayor. our universe at present. Madam Mayor. So I guess my, com my, my, com my comments on fees would be that, to me, I would have to hear something more substantive <laughs> than, um, than we're going to have some, uh, some complaints about, about upping fees to not go in the direction of 50% recovery. Um, I could, such things that would make me feel okay with not quite hitting 50 percent would be if we had, uh, if we implemented as we've discussed before and as, as as staff has talked about bringing forward a per unit or a per square footage um, fee over a certain unit size um, for um, especially in the downtown for 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 mixed use projects. So you say you set. A thousand uh, as the typical size, and then for every square foot over that, you set an impact fee um, uh, to deal, you know, to deal with. And my, what I've advocated for is that fee going towards affordable housing that mitigates um, uh, market rate uh, development and uh, open space acquisition because we don't have any mechanism for open space acquisition in the city um, besides the RDA, which doesn't run it out of money, um, or I suppose the other thing that we could, if staff feels is that such a, a such 50% fee uh, cost recovery would um, would end development um, in the city, and I, I don't I don't think you're going to say that, and I and I think there's always excuses. I mean, there's excuses now. The right now the excuse is the economy. Some some days the excuse is. You know, Wayne Schneider is going to stop all development in the city, um, uh, but but there's always an excuse, you know. Um, uh, the the uh, and and to me, um, fees are appropriate. They're especially appropriate if if and when we can um, give better service. And I think sometimes you we would probably get stakeholders more interested in a 60 percent or a 70 percent cost recovery than a 50 percent if there was um, more timely delivery of services. Um, so uh, that would be my comments on, on fees. Um, my only comment on the rest of the presentation would be just a plea that um, obviously zoning overview is busy, like all parts of the community development department. But um, there are, to me, are a lot of people uh, in this community that are suffering and will continue to suffer, and will or will no longer be be a part of this community if we don't address changes to the condo conversion ordinance. And so to me, I, I think that we need to prioritize this as the next thing from the pending and active list that moves up to the active list. Um, and I think we've seen plenty of issues and appeals that have been hard to handle because we have not updated um, uh, that. Okay. Mr. House. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a couple things. One, with regards to um, uh, the fees, I, I understand the, the balance between our, um, and maybe we we're looking for that right balance between what we um, need to charge to recover our costs, but also the costs that we intend to um, bear for the 
for the kind of process and the community benefit side of it. So I think I understand that relationship. And as we move towards a 50% um, number overall, uh, I hope that we also are mindful that um, uh, there's a the different scales of projects have different kinds of in almost almost exponential different kinds of uh, impacts on our uh, costs internally. So the small the small remodel is is at one level of, the, of it, and then there's the the large hotel project or major you know specific plan kind of size thing. And I think that um, when we do this, it may not be a one size fits all kind of a fee schedule. Um, so that's the one piece. The second, um, and, and, I, and I think then going to what Das is just talking about, the, um, we need to be looking very careful, carefully at our expectations in terms of what fees can generate and what benefit they can bring us if we're talking about some nexus between <laughs> development and, uh, and, and setting aside some of the money for affordable housing or for open space or something. Those are, I'm a little concerned that, and I'm not sure, I think maybe we need to study that and really understand that there's a, that, that we're able to, to um, get enough good result for with that approach. And I'm not against it. I just would like to know that it would make a difference. The last piece uh, on that, it goes a little bit to what um, we just heard as a comment from the floor, and that is I don't know that projects need so much nudging to move themselves along. Maybe facilitation, uh, maybe a process that is uh, – that is uh, efficient but still meets our, our, our own high standards. Um, but the interest costs, the holding costs of a project are a, enough internal incentive to move something along once it's been approved. And if it's taken a long time, um, it's not to their benefit. The, the, the tremendous costs of holding a project for a long time. So I, uh, I think maybe while it's in our, pro in our hands, the degree to which our process continues to be rational and to some degree linear, meaning that they don't move along to a certain point, and then somebody says, oh, we've, we forgot to tell you about that other thing you needed to know about, and then they have to go back, to sort of county-like, you know, where you go back to the beginning again, and then you go a ways, and then you have to, you find out there was another department you needed to talk to. No, the DART process is great because it helps to organize things so they can move through it efficiently. So facilitating those processes, uh, that's the best thing we can do on our end. And I just don't know that we can do much, excuse me, that we can do much to, um, to, halt the, uh, to, to move them along faster by using fees as a leverage tool. I don't think that, that is really the way to go. And my phone is ringing in case anybody wants to know. Isn't that great? Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, I appreciate that um, under Mr. Armstrong's watch, the, there has been a, an acceleration, uh, an increase in fees that's, that's been playing catch up for several years. Um, I've been uh, advocating uh, a, a stronger fee schedule for many of the years that I've been on the Planning Commission because I've seen in comparison to other, I think every other jurisdiction that I work in as a planning consultant that the city's fees, Santa Barbara city's fees, are just not even in the, in the same league. Um, there are uh, such things as traffic mitigation fees, there are Quimby Act fees for parks, um, to say nothing of, of just getting charged by the hour at some jurisdictions where they just charge you $100 an hour for staff time and you pay every month whatever, whatever, and they log their hours dutifully, uh, very dutifully. So I appreciate that, 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 that we don't do that, and I think it's a good system that we have. Um, I certainly uh, endorse the, the heading toward 50% um, uh, recovery, and that I, I heard Betty talking about watching the specific tasks and going, well, that task, we're at it, we're already at recovery there, the, the zoning information report. You're not going to in, in, increase that by 20% per year because it's already uh, covered. You're not trying to go overboard there, and I appreciate that. The one little element that, I, that um, I've seen during my time is getting behind the curve with fees. I think that there, it's almost like interest rates where I see the city having the ability to drop fees when we hit a bad recession, there may be an opportunity to say, 
we want to encourage development a little bit, and so we may be dropping fees to be stimulating, uh, being allowing the homeowner to come in and do the, the rebuild and so forth and so on. We dropped the inclusionary fee, as I recall, for the city. Is that not right, uh, 12 years ago, something like that? Just, it was like just in time for the boom to occur, we got rid of the inclusionary fee and uh, and then didn't replace it as the boom occurred. Well, so I think that there are uh, times if those things could be, there could be some flexibility and awareness of where we are in the market cycle that could help uh, be a win-win situation both uh, for, uh, be reasonable for the development community and also do a little better for city funding. Thank you, and as I say, I appreciate the, that we are in, in heading toward a basic policy of 50% recovery. Thank you. Okay. 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 Just a brief question. We've been talking about fees based on per square footage type of things for a couple of years off and on at different public hearings. And so, and I think, Betty, you brought that up once upon a time. So, and it's a good idea. So I just want to know what can be done to try to move that piece forward. And I guess the other general comment would be not every fee is the same as, as Bendy was just saying. And depending, there might be more incentives if there are things we want to see, like affordable housing that has lower fees versus full market rate housing and things like that. But could you comment on timing of how that could work? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, we're talking about two different types of fees. One is permit processing fees, and then another set of fees is development. Um, <coughs> what's the word? I'm forgetting. Impact, but fees. impact yeah. fees, yes, yeah, mitigation or impact fees. In terms of the development um, and mitigation impact fees, we have um, been doing, uh, Liz Limon actually, again, this is something that we have as part of the Plan Santa Barbara. We've done an initial study and review um, across the board what are uh, other communities doing, what might we generate in terms of revenues in the different areas that you could do impact fees tied to parks, housing, looking at our development activity trends, how much money might be generated with certain different types of fees. The first uh, presentation of that information is going to be before the task force, the special task group that the council created to look at public financing issues as a whole. So the development fees is really just a part of that overall public um, financing issue. We also plan on bringing that um, consultant we're working with to the Planning Commission as um, a presentation and discussion item at Planning Commission. And really that's more in the realm of Plan Santa Barbara. Staff hasn't proposed it as an independent action to take quickly, although I think council members have expressed that as a possible um, desire. We've still put it in the pot with the Plan Santa Barbara. And it is um, just around the corner. I don't know if we have a date. May? June? April. April for the task force, probably May for the planning commission then. We can turn it around. Thank you, Liz. Then as far as your uh, other question, we do differentiate. If you look at our fee resolution, you have to have a guide, you know, a professional show you. <laughs> no, it's, it is hard to find out. You know, we charge less for conditional use permits. Um, and uh, there are different uh, appeals are a bargain in the city, and I think that that was intentional. We've kept the appeal fee low to allow access, but that may be a policy issue that you'd like to look at as well. Um, so we don't do it across the board. We look very carefully at that. There isn't a special affordable housing fee, though. I, we have not done that, and I there isn't a discount or anything. That could be something we look at, uh, but the housing authority generally doesn't pay the fees at all. But if you have an, a, an affordable housing project, say, inclusionary is 15 percent, but someone's posing 35 percent, they still pay the basic fee, as it is now. Okay. Okay, thank you. We need to probably move on. I think the next item is of interest. I have one. Is it one one oh, okay. Yeah. And did you, John? Yes. You I did have a short comment. Okay. Okay, go ahead, John, and then we have a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Sure. Uh, just a couple of things. On the, on the, on the fee issue, uh, I think we've, we've kind of hit that one as, as best we could. Um, we're also seeing projects that go before ABR, and I think Mr. Bartlett will attest to this, many more times than two or three times, and that's an opportunity to say three strikes and you start over with the whole new fee. The same thing goes for as-built permits. We're seeing a lot of as-built permits come before the city, and they just get double the fee, I think. 
uh, it's, high, it's, it's high time to quadruple or quintuple, quintuple that, that fee so that it's, it's actually punitive for uh, breaking the laws that all the rest of us abide by. Uh, lastly, the outer state seat design, design guidelines. It's disappointing to see that pushed out three years. The Planning Commission was unanimous in, in making the recommendation to council that it be uh, uh, initiated before the end of 07. I, I think with the EIRs on some of these projects in Outer State Street, if you look at the new, um, the, the brand spanking new uh, Exhibit 11 on the, on the development trends, a lot of the development action is happening on Outer State Street, and we should uh, leverage those EIRs to get good direction on what design and compatibility issues are important and fold that into uh, expediting those design guidelines because Outer State Street doesn't, they're outdated. And downtown has them, the grid has some, Milpas has them. I think we need to do something about that. Okay. Okay. Ms. Falcone? Well, just very briefly, um, I'd like to echo what uh, John just said about the Outer State Street guidelines. Um, I really think we, uh, we need to, to take every advantage to um, get those done as soon as possible and uh, take advantage, as John says, with the projects that are coming up. But as far as the difference between the processing fees and the impact fees, impact fees are something that Santa Barbara has never done because we've always walked with the carrot and not the stick. Now, if we're changing direction, I think that needs to be done in a very... Um, a very eyes wide open and fully discussed public process and maybe that is the way we want to go into the future but I do think that it takes a lot of discussion as far as the processing fees are concerned I think that full cost recovery is probably where I'd like to see it go but I realize that that's probably not achievable uh, although part of me says well why not but it seems that there are these fees and these deadlines, some are uh, mandated by state law, some are our own jurisdiction imposed by ordinance or, or whatever. And although it, it seems to me that there may be some utility in looking at these side by side at some point and actually having possibly a workshop type of an atmosphere where you look and say, all right, these things are state law. We have to live within these constraints, but these are the ones that we have actually put on and have those literally listed and have them bandied about and see where the flexibility is. Having large projects treated differently than, than small projects I think is, is very beneficial and I think it's fair, although there has to be consistency across the board. And I think that might be a workshop sort of an atmosphere. So that's my suggestion on how to move forward with that. Okay. Yes, Don. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, would like to have under the Historic Preservation Work Program section active is the creation of a historic preservation element for the general plan update to include a demolition uh, demo by neglect ordinance. I think that we we need to put some real teeth behind what we're doing historically, and when we talk about we're being a little behind on or a lot behind on designations and things like this, I think that, that it, the whole process would benefit if we address it in our general plan update. So not having one, I think it would be very timely for Santa Barbara to join many other fine cities that are getting great ones. So everyone thinks we're the leader in it. We need to surprise them and do it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Madam Mayor? Ready to move on? Yes. Yes, I'd love mm -hmm. to have you move on. I just wanted to clarify one thing regarding Upper State Street. The um, council acted uh, to delay the Upper State Street guidelines for a couple reasons. One, there was a, a budgetary concern, and two, to look at a uh, transit corridor study first. So we will be returning to the council with that question at the appropriate time. It's not a foregone conclusion, just given whatever decisions are made about the transit corridor and the time on that, there will be an opportunity for the council to check back in and say, is now the time to pick this up? I just included it on the list um, as a possibility of being at a later date. But uh, 
i don't think i'm necessarily in a position to make that decision you know on my own but i did want to communicate that to you all just by saying twenty ten or post plan santa barbara you'll note that that's how it was described and then with regard to the historic preservation program much of the work that i think needs to be done wants to be done no real need to wait for plan santa barbara again there can be a lot of good work done in that arena based on our current general plan conservation element a variety of city policy so that's why again we want to make an effort to have a full discussion about that with the council as soon as we can Thank you. So I would like to turn over to Leslie Moan now to present the RENA uh, presentation. Madam Mayor. Okay, I think there was one Real, question. Or I have a quick question oh, okay. in, in okay, regards to this. Um, can you give me a, a reasonable explanation why we're not looking, and this has to do with lowering costs which relate to fees, and these design guidelines in a, a number of these major areas, in particular Upper State Street and Mopus and Haley, why we're not looking or at least starting a, a more robust discussion about form-based codes in these areas which which allow um, quicker processing, lower fees, uh, lower cost to staff time and staff times and stuff like that. Well, I think, again, that's why I think some the design line design guidelines can somewhat be the cart before the horse sometime. Your, your comment being what are the zoning-based parameters for size, bulk, scale, height, setback, amount of open space, um, if any of those types of things were going to change in within the zoning format, you would want those done first before and along with design guidelines. Really, I think the form-based coding is a, com is, is a marrying of zoning and design more closely together. And that option or consideration, I, I believe, is still on the table when we look at different area plans that could be um, coming out of the plan Santa Barbara process. So I don't think we foreclose that. But again, that's to me a question about whether or not you're ready to do design guidelines on Haley Milpas if we haven't really talked about in general how much change might occur in the Milpas area. What is the zoning and land use pointing in the right direction now for that part of town? Those are planned Santa Barbara discussions that we really should have before opening up our old guidelines and at least from my kind of planner perspective on how um, you, you proceed in the planning process. But form-based, sorry, <laughs> coding um, has been brought up in the context of planned Santa Barbara, I think, more than individual design guidelines at this point. Yeah. Okay, true. thank you. Okay, right Ms. Lamont. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Thank you for taking this time to let us brief you on things that have been happening um, at a technical planning level that became political very quickly. <laughs> and so we'd like to uh, brief Turn you on the regional political. housing needs allocation process. And at the conclusion, I wanted to give you the context and the background and then brainstorm uh, what our next steps uh, should be. As many of you know, state housing law requires every city and county to update their housing element roughly every seven years. The beginning of that process is um, what's called the regional housing needs allocation process. But state housing law is, identifies availability of housing for the growing population of the state of California as the highest priority. Um, that's one of the reasons why the housing element law is different from the other state planning laws that don't necessarily apply to charter cities. Housing element law does. They consider it of vital importance. Housing law requires cooperative participation of between government agencies in order to plan for the housing for a future population. And it really clearly states that all communities must plan for the housing, uh, especially for all income groups. <coughs> and those, those um, objectives follow straight through into our housing element. The regional housing needs allocation process is really dictated, again, by state law. And the objectives of that process is to increase the housing supply throughout California. And it also specifically wants to increase the mix of housing types. Um, tenure is renter versus owner-occupied units and housing affordability in all jurisdictions. Um, and the objectives of RENA are also are to uh, look at the housing needs of all economic segments and to, to uh, work on jobs, housing issues, and to avoid an over-concentration of uh, income groups, of low-income, uh, over-concentration of low-income households to distribute uh, 
the responsibility for that type of housing throughout the county. So uh, back uh, around November of this year, uh, SBCAG, the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments, got the final allocation from the State Housing and Community Development Department of how many units the county would have to plan for in our next planning period for the housing element, which is 2007 to 2014. And the number we got this time was 11,600. Um, in 2002, the number was 17,000, close to 18,000. So this was a significant drop. It, it reflected state-wide uh, projections about um, population growth not being quite as extreme in the growth. They, they tempered down their growth projections, mostly based on um, diff many different demographic factors and economics. So we got a number that was significantly less, and everyone across the board felt pretty relieved, and you could look back to SBCAG staff saying, I think this process is going to go better because we have a less smaller number for the county, so probably everyone will get a smaller number going into their housing elements. And so the next step after receiving the number from the state, SBCAG is responsible for then distribu distributing that number down to the cities and the county. And uh, then cities and counties are responsible to plan for that number in their housing element. Um, plan for means we have to show that we have a land inventory and a zoning capacity to meet the ultimate number that comes down from SBCAG on the RENA. So back in November when SBCAG got that number, they designated their Technical Planning Advisory Committee, or TPAC it's called, um, to hold public hearings and develop recommendations on the RENA. Um, I am the city's representative, the main representative on TPAC, and for the last two years or so have been saying, last time in 2002 everyone said this process is broken, it doesn't work right, we need to do it differently, and unfortunately time um, didn't allow for a different approach, and I think it's unfortunate actually that SBCAG board de delegated it to a technical planning advisory committee, especially since it's clearly becoming a very political um, decision and many other association of governments uh, designated steering committees with elected representatives and the technical planning representatives around a table to figure it out at the same time. But um, that is not the process that was developed for um, by SBCAG for this time around. So since November this technical planning advisory committee has been holding public hearings and working on developing recommendations for how the 11,000 units should be distributed throughout the county. Uh, we looked at north-south issues um, within the housing market areas of either the south coast of Santa Barbara or the San Ynez Valley, the Santa Maria region, and Lompoc Valley. And I have my super huge binder. I have a series of binders that have, since November, I've been able to accumulate quite a few reports and a lot of paperwork. So if anyone wants to know the details, <laughs> um, be happy to share that with you. Um, again, state law says the, the RENA process should allocate a fair share of the housing need to all jurisdictions. Um, since the 1980s, the city of Santa Barbara and the county have been, and SBCAG have been um, going through this process of developing a growth forecast, receiving a regional number from the state, and then developing a regional housing needs plan. And every time that this has happened, um, the first step is always to account for or take credit for the amount of housing that jurisdictions have projected to build over the next seven years. And in the current growth forecast, um, well, if, so over the years, that has always been the first step that's taken to bring down the um, growth forecast. And it usually accounts for 60 to 70 percent of the RENA is, is um, housing units that are already planned in people's general plans and are, are reflect the construction rate of actually housing that's been built. Uh, this time around, it would have accounted for 7,200 units or about 70 percent of that RENA, then the remaining um, number is where you apply this methodology and um, you have more discretion on how it goes to um, the different jurisdictions. Also in the past, every, ever since the 1980s, and I think there's been four cycles, uh, local plans and policies have always been respected. Possibly the city of Goleta, who had just incorporated last time, could say that they, they weren't respected in 2002. But that was difficult because they weren't at the table. They had just um, incorporated. But showing what the local jurisdiction zoning and general plans have planned for has always been a benchmark. And since I've been on the committee in, the, in prior cycles, we always wanted to make sure that we didn't give someone a, an allocation that went beyond um, 
their build out anticipated in their general plan. So what we have right now, we're at the early stages of, of developing the regional housing needs plan. We have a recommendation from TPAC and SBCAG on, on how the 11,000 numbers should be distributed. And neither of them take into account planned uh, housing growth or local plans or policies. On March 12th, this all happened very uh, quickly. Uh, the TPAC uh, developed their recommendation to um, SBCAG. And I'm going to give you the big picture here and all, none of the details, although I'm happy to answer questions um, that anyone might have, but we do want to get to your discussion. Um, and the TPAC proposal itself represented a major shift in how the regional housing need was distributed. It shifted from the north to the south, and then from unincorporated areas shifted a, many of the um, units to the cities. And I hope you got the letter that we submitted to SBCAG that show, visually shows, I wasn't able to get the charts in here um, in time for you today, but it shows the significance of the change from 2002 to 2008. Um, and the percentages there are uh, the unincorporated areas got 35% in 2002, and they shrunk to 15%, and the shift was to the cities. Now you look at this, and in principle, a lot of the a lot of the shift is consistent with our general plan policies and, and housing element. We do think growth should be in infill and in and around downtown, and not in the um, discouraged sprawl and not gobble up open space, etc. So, so there was part of it that was um, felt right and consistent with our plans and policies, but the significance and the magnitude of the change um, was, is a great concern to us. And I apologize because most of these charts reflect the TPAC mm -hmm. recommendation and what SBCAG did took it even farther. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have one choice, mm -hmm. one sh slide that shows you that. But, you have that. Yes, I'll get there. So that. So this on the, just shows you the change from 2002 to 2008. Everyone to the left in the red mm -hmm. got fewer mm -hmm. units and you can see the bottom line is the county unincorporated areas throughout and um, the three cities that took more for us. This is the chart showing uh, the build out to the arena. Just to be clear, this, this is like the zone, zoning capacity that Santa Maria has reported, Lee has um, unincorporated Santa Ynez Valley, Lompoc City. And these are all numbers that, were in, uh, that are in the regional growth forecast as reported. Um, and the city of Santa Barbara here, this is our general plan, current general plan build out. And this is the arena that, that TPAC was uh, recommending, but it's up even, it's even more greater. Yeah. This shows you one of our concerns when we went to the SB County, SBCAG board. We said we, we accept the, the concept that there are more jobs in the south part of the county and that there should be more units coming down to the south than we did in 2002. So we sort of accepted that shift, but what we had great concern about was the distribution of the number of units on the south county, um, on the south coast. And as you can see, in 2002, we took 39%. Um, and Goleta was at 40%, Carpentry was extremely low, and the county unincorporated areas were at 20%. Um, and that was deemed fair uh, based upon how the region functioned at that time. In 2008, the Technical Planning Committee, um, over my objections, <laughs> uh, re and the county, the county staff person was very strong on, on the committee, and I'll show you a few quotes uh, to give you an idea of what we were up against. Um, anyway, the TPAC proposal ended up assigning us 56% of the entire South County um, allocation. Again, a lot of discussion about the city has all the jobs, the city's creating um, the need for housing, and the city should be building the housing. Um, and Goleta was at 27%, which was down from before. Uh, Carpentry went up, um, and they were uh, fine with that. And the county was at 11%. What the TPAC was recommending was a major shift. This was the position I ended up taking, a major shift in regional planning. Um, and it was a, a policy shift that is not reflected in the county general plan, and it wasn't reflective of how the South County, the South Coast functions. Um, again, we were okay with the North to the South shift in units, but the, the magnitude of the shift from the North to South and the magnitude of the shift from the unincorporated areas to cities, again, speaking for the South Coast, um, was much true, too significant for us. Um, in fact, even in a recent staff report to TPAC, TPAC, the SBCAG staff said 
the RENA is a very blunt instrument to achieve this sea change in land use policy. Um, again, the South County distribution isn't reflective of how the region functions um, as far as we are one jobs and, and housing market. Uh, and we also felt strongly that local plans and policies should be considered. I just had to put this in here. This is from a county letter um, to give you an illustration of the extreme conversation <laughs> we had at TPAC. They uh, submitted a letter in, in February, one of many correspondences, um, that they're, they claim that the cities have, on the South Coast have significant housing deficiencies and that the unincorporated areas actually have a surplus of housing. Um, and that, again, it's the city of Santa Barbara's responsibility to house the workers here and not any unincorporated areas, Summerlin, Montecito, Eastern Goleta Valley. And so below it actually shows that they did a jobs housing analysis for the South County and their conclusion, they didn't recommend this, but this was a study that led to their, um, their other recommendation, was the city of Santa Barbara should add 23,609 <laughs> units. We have 36, 37,000 on the Total. ground today. Yeah. With the straight face, and then if you see down at the bottom, the county unincorporated area is zero because they have a surplus, surplus of housing on the south coast. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, here's the graph showing what SBCAG um, approved. The, the recommendation went to TPAC, or went to the um, board just last Thursday. Um, the mayor was there, uh, and I strongly urge you all to watch um, watch that. Oh, they have copies. And okay. Um, it was a very um, difficult meeting, and the outcome for us was really grim. And we had the letter. It was very clear that no one had looked at the letter. No one was interested in hearing the letter. Um, no one was interested in hearing um, Betty's compromise, which was, again, just to look at the South County and try to do a more fair distribution of units. Um, it really wasn't a matter of facts. It was... Yeah. Uh, they didn't discuss it. There no. was no discussion if you watch it. No. And so we ended up with, again, this is a vote on the methodology on how to distribute the units. SBCAG voted last week to give the city of Santa Barbara about 4,400 units. Um, next is Santa Maria has, has less. And then you can see how, how small fraction, the portion everyone else has. Um, and again, this is the chart that we showed earlier. It just gets worse <laughs> as far as a build out. Again, at the Technical Planning Committee and at the SP, SPCAG board, there was no interest in what local plans and policies were saying. Absolutely no interest. There was just an interest in giving the South Coast as many as they could and really the city of Santa Barbara. So again, their action really is a paradigm shift in regional planning. And that quote is from the county staff person at TPAC who was saying the jobs housing imbalance is so out of whack that we need a paradigm shift. And that's what he was advocating for. Um, our problem with that is the focus on political boundaries and not geographic realities. So um, on the South Coast, just because Toro Canyon is a county unincorporated area means, or Summerlin, sh they shouldn't have to add any units, but the city of Santa Barbara, city of Carp, and the city of Goleta should have to t share the whole, um, bear the whole burden, and it just doesn't make sense, and it doesn't reflect how the area um, functions. I, on the TPAC, would say SBCAG spends transportation money to help bring workers from the unincorporated areas to the city. I mean, that's a major part of our transportation solution. Isn't that a, it, it's a, it's one region and it's a good thing and we need to do better, but, um, and Mickey was, came to one of the meetings and did a really good job of talking about it. it's the long distance commuting that we're concerned about, but no one uh, really was interested in discussing the facts or how much this didn't reflect the, the realities of the South Coast. So here's the next steps in the process. Um, tomorrow, actually, the SBCAG staff is releasing a draft plan that incorporates the, the methodology that the board uh, adopted last week. And there's a, another technical planning advisory committee next week to uh, make a recommendation to SBCAG board on the plan. I have voted no on all the, all the scenarios and recommendations for for various reasons, but mostly just because of the significant regional planning shift um, and that this isn't the way to achieve that. Um, April 17th, SBCAG board is going to receive the, the regional housing need plan and release it for a 60-day review period. 
that's the time where local agencies have a chance to request revisions. And we will be drafting a letter. I'll probably start on it tomorrow, and we'll be coming to the Planning Commission and Council to move that letter forward um, to call for revisions. But frankly, the vote at SBCAG on the methodology was nine to three, and there was no apparent, no indication that there would be any movement because everyone else got the small number. Because yes. <laughs> when it comes back to it, like yeah, even if you have more planned for in your general plan, you still want a, a smaller number. So. Then SBCAG board will hold a hearing on the final plan, and then there's a whole another appeal um, process, and the ultimate um, determination is by HCD in November of 2008. And we'll need to be re researching options on the appeal process and everything else. It's just happening very fast. I didn't get to this slide. <laughs> why does this matter? It, that's why we're here today. We want to talk about it. I, I would. I know Mr. Justice just said that there's the. Uh, um, the development trends staff report has, has gone out. And part of that, we have been doing a, a great deal of analysis of the amount of residential that could be built in our commercial zones. Mm -hmm. It hasn't ever really been done. And I put the map in here, but I, it's really hard to see. But you'll have to look at it in the report. And that's not even the right map, I don't think. Oh, yes, it is. The light blue, it's hard to see, though. Mm -hmm. It, the potential build-out parcels, we did a very detailed analysis um, looking at parcels that were likely to redevelop um, based on their low property value and their low improvement value and whether um, anything had been built on it recently. And uh, we came up with a range, a possible range of additional dwelling units that can be built in our commercial zones. What's Plan Santa Barbara was all about having this discussion in the community in a proactive way mm -hmm. and looking at where these units are. Does it make sense with our housing element? Is it meeting our community needs? Is it consistent with our transportation element? And to look at it in a proactive, roundtable way and, and, and set, decide what our future should be and how much of this really should be there or are there some areas where maybe we want to look at small business preservation zones or, or, or some other ways to adjust our plans and policies to reflect our, our needs and the market, the housing market changes that have happened over the last seven years that are, are so incredible. So the whole part of Plan Santa Barbara was to do that proactively. We're just getting ready to do it. And I really appreciate the Planning Commission trying to speed up and had, had even said in their meetings, we don't want the housing element to drive the Plan Santa Barbara process. And what happened last Thursday, um, well, over the last four weeks or so, uh, it is potentially very significant, and it could drive this process. Um, and the number of units you'll see in the report, um, we do. It does look like there's about five to six thousand units based on this analysis that could be allowed, way greater than our forty thousand five um, zoning build-out estimate, which is very strongly held um, in the community. And so we need to have the work sessions and roll our sleeves up and, and talk about this. So, and then again, just the regional planning principles that we support. It's been in our general plan since 1970. The impacts of growth uh, report said the South Coast is one run region. There should be um, urban areas should be in cities. The county areas should be open space and parkland and ag uses. Um, the problem is arena isn't the way to get there. It, um, and no one's engaged us in a dialogue. They just um, us inserted themselves through the arena process and gave us huge numbers. So. If I could, some could I add something yeah. just right there? Because we are the only county, or maybe there's one other county of the 58 counties that made a decision a couple years ago not to prepare a blueprint so uh, for growth. So all the other counties, Monterey, LA, everybody did this. They prepared blueprints for growth. And then they get the RENA numbers and they put it within that blueprint for growth. But our SBCAG voted not to be part of that. So what happens is we get the RENA numbers and there's no blueprint for growth. There's no plan that we can just say, well, of course, they go here and there. And, and so instead it becomes a political animal, which is not a very pretty thing. And then the second thing I did want to add that um, this, was, this was really good, but remember when we went to LAFCO, 
to talk about urban areas should be in cities and so on, and they voted no. <laughs> and then at SBCAG, I hear one of the LAFCO members giving the speech that I gave about urban areas should be in cities. And so my frustration is the good planning is very important. And I don't, I think because we said no to the blueprint, and I've been trying to get them to do that, um, and it's not moving, obviously. Um, but the good type of planning and the LAFCO issue, um, just, it's just, uh, it's wound up in such a Gordian knot, I don't know how to untie it. And I think HCD, you know, at the state level would be very interested in Santa Barbara being one of the only counties, if, if not the only county, not to um, opt for being a planning tool at SBCAG. Instead, they say, no, we just want to pay attention to transportation, which to me doesn't solve this kind of problem. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted to add that. No, thank you. That's, that's my briefing. That's sort of the context. I have any welcome to answer any questions, but I just want to hear uh, sure. people's comment about where sure. we are. Sure. Madam Mayor? Sure. Yes. Sure. Just to follow on, on your comment, one of the reasons that uh, SBKEG did not do a blueprint mm -hmm. is that they uh, uh, were designated as one of seven regions, interregional issues areas in the state. They did uh, a, uh, a regional, interregional partnership. Uh, report, which had a whole series of, of uh, comments about mm -hmm. collaboration, about strategic partnerships, uh, and uh, that report has gone nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a shame because it's a good report. Mr. Uh, Roger was there. Mr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Horton uh, mm -hmm. was really a, a hard worker in trying yeah. to make this happen, but. Uh, and he said at the time it's going to sit on the shelf. Yes, and and so this <laughs> is the, the death of regionalism, as far as I'm concerned. This, this, this action is the death of regional yep. in Santa Barbara County. Bad. Okay. We have a couple speakers, but if we have questions, go ahead, Mr. Myers. Thank you. Um, from what I can read and, and what I've seen, it's hard for me to understand some of the methodology, in particular uh, the Galita number. Can you give us a little, and it, and it sort of pertains to your comments about how we uh, politically look at this from other areas in the South Coast region, like Summerland and, and some of the unincorporated areas. But w why did that Galita number ch change so significantly to the to the downside from the 40-some percent to the 20 percent? That's a good question. Um, I do think their number was uh, possibly on the high side in 2002 because they were not at the table right and we were at they they were almost treated comparable to us which isn't fair and um, so it seemed appropriate that their number would go down as far as the South County it's still a significant number for them and um, and on the technical planning committee they the Galita representative didn't they wanted our affirmative vote and they were at the table they said is there anything we can do city of Santa Barbara to have you <clears throat> make this a, a unanimous vote or a consensus vote and it wasn't it's 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 not the Galita or the Carpinteria it's not the city's number to me they had enough it's that the county was saying we don't want any and they were taking a 200 number so it was the county that needed to come the county unincorporated areas that needed to be there and they were represented by public members at the meeting, too. There were a couple of um, kind of intent. February 28th, there was a um, Eastern Goleta Valley was there. And, um, but one of the public members made the most astounding statement to me. She said the Goleta Valley has taken more, a greater percentage of low-income housing than any other jurisdiction in the county. And I don't know where she got that. I just that was astounding to me. So Madam I hope that Mayor. fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, I have a couple. Yeah, questions. go ahead, Mr. House. Um, one Mr. has to do the word methodology just came up. Um, yeah. It's my understanding that there's been some really, um, I guess I'll, I'll add the value spurious um, uh, approach to attributing um, the the jobs, for instance, with uh, Cottage Hospital would be an example, but some of the major employers or some of the development that's going on. Um, which um, doesn't appear to me to be, especially given the way that we manage things with Measure E, um, creating great new um, 
uh, employment bases and such. But um, so the first that, that that's a question as to how uh, you see us um, uh, addressing what may be a mistake in the way the the, the beginning numbers came where they came from in the first place. The second um, one has to do with um, I understand that in the arena process there's a bifurcation of the, the, the gross number and then another process for attributing workforce or affordable housing. I guess maybe even affordable is the uh, specific category. And um, uh, one letter to the editor or some something I saw recently, uh, maybe, maybe it was yours, Mickey, but there was something about the, the regional housing need, the whole idea of need, like what do we really need? We need workforce housing. We need um, housing for a range that's not being met by the market and that we can't, by, by our mandate, we can't meet it um, by the government. So um, how, how and when in that process do we really get down to meeting the, the need that we might say is an authentic need? For, for housing for our region. And then the last question is that the three is, how do they deal with um, uh, the potential for um, um, housing to be uh, constructed in relationship not just to, say, job centers, but to uh, transportation corridors, um, transit corridors, such as Hollister would be an example, or going out in the other direction along Highway 101 as it goes through Summerlin. And, but there's places where there's, there's the transit availability, the, uh, the land even may be more available than there would be inside the city. And the proximity, it's not that far away from jobs. Um, where in the process does the technical group or, or where, do, where does that get discussed and addressed? So those are the three questions. One is the methodology issue, the other is the low-income workforce, and the other one is the dealing with the actual proximity to transit and to transportation in the, within a region. Okay, Madam Mayor, Council Member House, excellent questions. Um, for starters, on the gro regional growth forecast, uh, it was adopted in 2007, I believe, and the Technical Planning Committee spent a year going chapter by chapter over everything. Um, and it is, the, the beginning is like a 12-page summary of um, numbers, and then there's a series of, I think, 10 or 11 appendices. Um, in the, the beginning of the growth forecast, it shows the amount of building permits issued that they had uh, received um, through the uh, UC economic forecast, their reports. And the, the square footage amount, the, the square footage was accurate for the amount of square footage that has been um, issued building permits and is projected over the next few years. But it's different from Measure E because Cottage Hospital was issued a building permit for 400,000, so it wasn't that the building permit issued was incorrect. Um, it's the generating jobs and employment forecast from that. And so at the time, we, I, I didn't comment on that because it was accurate on the building permit. And also jobs had never been such a significant part of the RENA process. That was a switch that happened um, in January. It was very surprising that the, um, rather than looking 70 percent or so on housing growth, it became um, 80 to 90 percent focused on job growth. And, um, and back in, I think it's Appendix 7, Table 4, or something <laughs> in the growth forecast, there, there are tables that I referenced here that then um, included employment forecast. And I didn't see it at the time, and nobody else did. But they just can't be right. I mean, they show for over a seven-year period that um, the city of Santa Barbara would add about 4,200 new jobs over seven years, which that in and of itself seems a year. way too much but that the unincorporated mm -hmm. South Coast, including oh, UCSB, <laughs> uh, Westmont, uh, Miramar Hotel, you name it, is going to add 161 jobs over that same time period. I didn't see it during the growth forecast. It came out at the Technical Planning Committee that that's their job basis. When I raised it and said, this is not right, not the logical. technical planner said, the growth forecast is adopted. You missed your chance. You know, it's an adopted document. That's what we have to base it on, which is it's ludicrous. Yeah. Um, and it was funny when you even look over a 30-year period, it, it got even more ridiculous that the from 2005 to 2040, the growth, pro um, growth forecast projects the city to add 9,800 jobs and the county unincorporated 380 <laughs> with the UCSB. <laughs> Plan, you know, and it's just the has a long-range plan that's going to grow a, a percent a year, and they really aren't exactly going to do anything. So the technical planning advisory committee didn't want to 
look at how ridiculous that was. The SBCAD board wasn't even interested in talking about it at all. Yes. Janet Wolfhouse talked about the jobs wanting more correct information. Yeah, but she never got it. But it didn't become an issue. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to comment that at the two SBCAG board meetings, Janet Wolf did ask. Mm -hmm. She thought that the SBCAG board, I think, staff would return it with new information, and she asked that question to me, and I said, no, there, you know, there is no inf new information. But I think that's an area that we want to delve into more in detail in our response to the plan letter. Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, we look, uh, we talk with local economists, we do surveys of job growth from major employers, and we get some actual facts of what the job growth has been in this community um, relative to these um, really outlandish, I believe, uh, projections that just are not going to hold water. Yeah. Okay. Bendy? Oh, then you had two other. Sorry, you didn't answer the other two. Yeah. Um, as far as the income so distribution, the bedding, yeah. that is a requirement by state law to do very low, uh, low, moderate, and then above moderate. And historically, and what's currently going to be in the plan is the reflected um, builds off the 2000 census where um, those households in those income categories are, and then there's a, a factor for that it's very much not related to the workforce. And that's an issue that I brought up too when they switched to the, the whole discussion of workforce housing. Above moderate housing on the South Coast is not workforce housing. So we're getting a huge number. I'm not sure what it is. It'll be in the plan that will be on the SBCAG <coughs> website tomorrow. But it's not going to meet workforce needs based on the economics of, of our housing market. And then um, your third question about transit quarters, we did in January ask um, SBCAG staff to look at a, a factor um, where transit is and housing along on transit corridors. And um, they had a very difficult time doing that um, and couldn't find examples of other places that had done it in the RENA process. Uh, and in the end, and looked at the Association of Bay Area governments and saw that their transit factor was a very small percent of their uh, RENA, and they said if, if um, the Bay Area isn't doing a higher percent based on transit location, it's and with all their rail and, and transit resources, um, that they didn't think it was right for us. And so the Technical Planning Committee uh, dropped that as a consideration. The, the SP Mr. Joseph said the death of regional planning, was that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what was it, the, 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 the end of it? My, my, my intention was to say that this is seriously threatens regional cooperation. Absolutely. Yeah. Just too bad. Bendy? <laughs> and then he and then the is next. The, I think that this, what we're seeing today is the, is the, um, it's kind of the four, part of the four, what we've been having a foreboding about, uh, which is uh, SBCAG is not a fair playing field when it comes to population. And I don't hear, um, I, mean, I looked up, I Googled Guadalupe today, and it's uh, our equal vote. That's one to one. Um, there, and they have about... Um, uh, five percent of our population or something like that seven percent of our population um, Buellton has about the same number um, so uh, it, uh, the question there is isn't there a way to is uh, well, one question is is the rest of the CAGs in the state like equ equivalently structured is are, are the others more closer to a proportionate voting system, I would think it would be one place to look. And secondly, don't do we have? We must have recourse. I mean, we're still losing the population gain, thank goodness, to the North County. But um, at least it should be on a relatively fair, uh, a reasonable popular one, one person, one vote kind of situation, and that we should be able to use our legislator uh, or legislators to help us get there or, or advocate on that behalf. I, it just, uh, this is the one of the first sort of really outrageous uh, ones, ones to come down. Maybe everybody's been kind of playing 
uh, just being kinder up until now, but now we're just fi seeing the, the, the boot come down uh, uh, in a heavy way. But I would ask that, that uh, our, our team look to state uh, action to, first of all, understand how we're doing relative to other CAGs, and secondly, uh, head in the direction of making that a fairer process. Okay, let's sit back on it. And then we have a couple members of the public. Well, why don't you take the public first, then I'll come right after that, if that's all right with you. Okay. Uh, Kellen DeForest. Be followed by Mickey Flax. Excuse me, Kellum DeForest. I didn't realize this. R H N A process was as dire. I read a little bit about it in the paper, and it sounded like something off there in somebody's pie in the sky dream. But it seems to have gotten. It seems to be much worse than that, and definitely should be. Publicized because I think if the uh, population of Santa Barbara County, especially the South Coast, realizes what they were forcing us to do and how stupid and silly the figures are, that they would rise up and march on Sacramento. The uh, so where are the figures coming from? I mean, it's it's just ludicrous as has been pointed out that uh, the unincorporated South Coast is going to go to get 161 uh, jobs and w and why aren't they considering the uh, suburban areas that are unincorporated in the county uh, what ha and what happens to their plan? If Nolita suddenly be, uh, opts to be uh, annexed by either Galita or Santa Barbara, hopefully Santa Barbara, uh, that would change the whole paradigm. And then, isn't this all going to be outdated by the 2010 census? And could this eventually? It doesn't be appealed to the through the courts, because it doesn't seem to have much basis in fact. It seems to be somebody's pipe dream. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fax? Fax? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Kelly. We'll, we'll take them with us. Yeah. We go to the state. Save the seat. So now that CSP is part of Allied, maybe you'll be hearing more about the Rena numbers. They've been yelling about it for years, um, but the shoe is on the other foot. Um, the Rena process is a joke, uh, not the least of which is that it creates paper housing. Not a single unit is built as a result of the Rena process. It only requires zoning capacity. Uh, and the county has adopted not just this time, an utterly cynical approach to RENA. Um, for, two, for the last RENA period, they put all of the housing, the paper housing, in Isla Vista. Um, and I understand that H state HCD, which is required to approve every, count, every uh, county's SB, um, RENA numbers, is not happy with the plan which means that in addition to the 11,000 some that the county is supposed to plan for now, the additional 6,000 or so that they were supposed to plan for before might well be added onto it because the state does not consider that they have already planned for that. So the whole thing has become, in my opinion, and I think in any rational person's opinion, a totally political game. It has nothing to do with reality um, we should stop and think where this came from. came from state 
uh, legislators concerned, and I think with some legitimacy, concerned about some about the fact that the population in the state of California was growing, and there were some counties, notably Marin, Santa Barbara, some others, that seemed to be closing the doors and saying, well, you, you know, you may have a population increase in the state, but we don't want any more population increase here. I think that kind of attitude to the extent that exists, that it exists is short-sighted. Um, and the state legislature, in an attempt to deal with that, created this arena process. However, it left too much of its implementation to the county uh, governments. And while it is a regional approach, the regional mechanisms don't really exist. Or if they do, they too are paper mechanisms. So we have an SB CAG that is unfair because given the number of very small cities that we have. And also, does it really have um, the power to do very much? The power ultimately resides in the Board of Supervisors. All of this stuff gets appealed to and gets finally ruled on by the Board of Supervisors, which is more proportionately fair. That is in terms of, of one person, one vote. So I think you know, you guys are used to dealing with nuts and bolts, but I think it really is a political approach that we have to take if we want to get anywhere. I wrote a letter to everybody on SBCAC, to everybody in sight, um, pointing out some of these things, pointing out that it's called a regional housing needs assessment, but it doesn't deal with needs. It talks about, it looks at the census figures as to what percentage of the population, say, is above moderate income, and then it says, well, then the new housing has to have that percentage of, uh, of housing for persons above moderate income. Well, how many of the people who exist above moderate income are in need of a home? Uh, I don't think there are too many. And yet, the, the RENA numbers don't take that to, into account. Similarly, with low income, they don't look at jobs and what they're paying and where those jobs are located. Now, I, I asked once the, the uh, uh, Bill, what's his name from the um, UC forecast, Bill Watson from the UC forecast project, I said, Santa Maria is growing. What is the economic engine that is driving the growth in Santa Maria? He said, housing. Mm -hmm. That is the construction of housing is what's is the payroll in Santa Maria. Well, that's not sustainable. That's, you know, that's got to stop at some point. Furthermore, cities are by their nature, that's what they're for, is to be job centers. That's, that's what an urban area is for. And for, that to say, for them to say, therefore, that a city like Santa Barbara that has developed over 50 years with, a, with satellite areas, suburban or non-incorporated, whatever you want to call it, and a major job center, namely the university, outside of its boundaries, and to say that then all of the jobs are created within the city is absurd. The, the UCSB is planning for 5,000 new students. It has been calculated that the multiplier for each student is one point something yeah. persons. Um, so those 5,000 new students will bring six or 7,000 new persons into the area, including things like, uh, of course, the people who have the jobs, the faculty and the staff, but also the spouses of those people who need jobs. And also the fact that those 10,000 new people, counting students, will shop at Vons in Lita, and Vons has to hire an extra checker or two who needs a job, uh, who needs a home. So job growth has to be analyzed in terms of what is the nature of the job growth? What is the economic level of the people of the new, newly created jobs? And to try to find ways to match the housing to those people and primarily to look at it regionally. Everybody knows that mm -hmm. you live, you work in the city of Santa Barbara, you may or may not live in the city of Santa Barbara. Lately, you may live very far away, and that's not so good. But historically, you may live in Goleta, you may live in Carpinteria, or somewhere in between. You may even, God forbid, want to live in the eastern Goleta Valley. 
uh, and yet your job is in the city of Santa Barbara. None of this is taken into consideration. It is a totally cynical, unreal process. And I think that rather than accept what's being done, and I'm, you know, I'm a housing advocate, and I think that the city should have more housing and should be denser, but not by this kind of means, not yeah. by fake allocations, not by a charade. So whatever legal action we can take to stop this, although remember, we've, we still have a political fight to the Board of Supervisors. Not sure we'll win. A lot of it depends on the June election. Um, but then it has to be taken to the state level. And I have been talking to our state representatives and our potential state representatives to try to find ways to create a rena like process. That is a way to try to determine what the housing needs of the state of California is and allocate them, but one that is real, uh, makes sense, and um, is not a figment of somebody's imagination. Right. We'll save a place on the bus for you, too. <laughs> We're all headed up there, I think. Okay. Um, Ia, and then just a second. And uh, after that, Bruce, and then uh, Das. Okay, go ahead, Ia. Well, I, I know we're running late on time, and I'm awfully glad that uh, Mickey spoke before I did because um, I'm just going to add a little bit to, to what she has to say because she's absolutely right. Having not only followed the process, been involved with the process, spoken with people, but I rewatched the hearing this morning. So I recommend, re and I took notes on exactly what everyone sort of said and what their positions were so that I was clear coming into this meeting mm -hmm. today. I recommend it to you all to, so that you hear exactly what it is that everyone specifically said and what their positions were. Because we can all take offense and we can all point fingers and so forth. That's not useful. What's useful is to understand that the county representatives and a lot of a lot of other representatives as well came from a premise that their function, their charge, is to do certain things. Mental health, welfare, rehab, hospital, preserve ag. That's their charge. With you know, there are other things I didn't list them all. But that's their charge. It's not necessarily to provide housing. At least that's the concept they came from, whether you agree with it or not. The other concept is that people and jobs are in urban centers. They are in incorporated cities. So this was the basic philosophy that they were working from, or at least that most of them were coming to the table with. It's my opinion that they were not looking at the job growth going forward at all. What they were doing was they were trying to remedy a past injustice that they feel that the city of Santa Barbara in particular does not carry its own weight with respect to housing in comparison to the number of jobs that it historically has had. This was a way to try to remedy it going forward, that they would plunk down or at least in paper form put down a number of units in the city balancing the jobs housing and then I don't know what their idea about going forward into the future is but that was I think the premise of where this began and where this ended up um, on Thursday. Now the methodology that they used in coming up with the figures that you cited, Liz, with respect to how many jobs we're going to create into the future and how many how that's all result driven. That's all result driven. So if you start with a conclusion, you can write anything to get there. So that's how I believe they got to those numbers. But they were really looking backwards, in my opinion. So is the methodology flawed? Probably, you know, probably. And according to Kevin Reddy, their counsel, this morning when I was watching the tape, he said that appeals are based on flawed, capricious, or arbitrary processes. So that's one of the fundamental um, levels of proof that you have to get to. Now, I'm going to leave it to the various councils and other places to figure out exactly whether or not there's an avenue there. 
but it seems to me that a good argument could certainly be made. As Mickey said, this is purely politics. In fact, it was most, um, it was most glaringly apparent when Andy uh, went on his rant and uh, called us the most selfish jurisdiction he'd ever seen. He was entitled to his opinion. He's not entitled to his attitude. It was uncalled for. However, when the equations and the outcomes don't make sense, sense, then the process isn't pure. So, I put that out there as a place to start from. Let's all recognize what they did, why they did it, and not engage in a whole lot of other, you know, he said, she said. Understand why they did it. And now let's see if we can fix it. Because we can't stand for this, A, being put upon this way. We need to, you know, push back. And plus, we can't sustain the number. It's well beyond what our public is going gonna, is gonna to support, on paper or not. So, thank you. Bruce? Well, I wish I had seen the tape before coming here, but I'll make sure that I see it afterwards. I think people are having a huge reaction because I think a, an abrupt correction course is taking place. And, and what's causing that? I mean, if we look back at the last where's this on? I three years of practice with this. So. <laughs> I'll use this one. If we look back at the last four or five five-year peds periods of RENA allocation, we have been falling so short of those numbers. This process is a joke. I mean, as Mickey said, RENA, it's paper housing only. It has no basis in reality. So in our presentation that we had in January at Planning Commission, for the last five-year allocation, the city of Santa Barbara was allocated 2,333 units. In that same five-year period, we only accomplished 770 units. That's built and approved, so that's not even on the ground, half of which was our housing authority. So we are so far off the mark. We've been off the mark for 25 years that I don't blame other counties or even other cities for making us correct our way. We can't go on with this suburban model of exporting our housing outside of not only our city limit, but our county limit. We need to look at this not as a county boundary, but it, it's a regional b boundary. We should be including Ventura. But the fact that the county line is right below Carpinteria just skews everything. So no matter what the numbers tell us, we know what the truth is. We're not, we don't have enough housing for our workers. And this is exactly what Rena is telling us. So let's not argue about how the method is, the message is being delivered. Let's figure out how this message can help us get to where we need to be anyway. Granted, we don't like the fact that the pendulum has swung totally the opposite direction, but, you know, 25 years of behaving badly, at some point, there's repercussions for that. So I think. In some ways, we've asked for it, but I think we're smart enough to figure out how can we get it in the way that we need it. We need to. We need the housing that they're saying we need. We just need to figure out how can we get it to be workforce housing and not all bottom end or luxury. We have both ends covered, but our middle is wide open right now. So I think this is where the general plan is so critical, and because we have not got it updated soon enough, this is what's happening to us. Other people around us are reacting. North County doesn't want it anymore. I'm sure if Ventura was included in our county, we'd be getting the same, same message for them. But luckily, there's a boundary line, so it's taboo. So uh, I think we really need to try and make this work to our advantage. We do need the housing along the transit corridors. We do need the housing downtown. If we included the housing that is available in commercial zones, we're not that far off the mark. But when you look at the numbers and say, you know, they're asking for 150 percent of our build out, that's because we're ignoring the fact that you can build residential and commercial 
areas. We don't need the density in suburbia. We need it downtown where we can minimize our impact. So, I, granted, I don't like how the message has been delivered, but I think there's some validity in the message, and we need to listen to it and figure out another way. So, I mean, let's 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 address what's not fair and what we heard, but let's also recognize our shortcomings and roll that into the general plan and I think be proactive. I think that's why this is happening. We're so late with our own critical thinking that this is a reaction to that. Thank you. You know, Bruce, I, I, I don't want to argue anything, but I don't think if we had our general plan in place, if we had already finished it, you know, by December, I don't think they even care. They don't care at all because we would have had you know, neat little boxes that would have been a little bit right. nicer or something like that. I don't think the general plan update has anything to do with this at all. Right, but this. But I understand what you. I understand it, your point, and it's well taken. But I don't. I just wanted to clarify that. Right. I really don't think that mattered at all. But it is also, you know, as was pointed out, it is a paper process. We're not yeah, being mandated to build it. Right. But we do need to at least have the correct zoning. Well, but we have to plan for it, and what, what I'm concerned about is just that when we plan for it in Santa Barbara, things happen. You know, things get built. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would be uh, shocked, and maybe it would happen, if we took this on an advisory vote of the city. I'd be shocked if you got more than 20, 30 percent of the people saying yes on it. So I'm just, I'm just telling you... Um, Try walking door to door and talking to people about this. Well, no, be but, very interesting. but what we sometimes what we want and what we need are two different things. And oh, at some absolutely. Point, at some I've point, raised three kids. I understand that. Right. But I'm just saying. Right. Um, it's breaking anyway. our own bad habits is hard to. Yeah. Uh, I think I said Das and then and then uh, and then Dale and you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would I would argue that um, the percentage the changes in methodology, South County versus North County, um, incorporated versus unincorporated, and based on jobs, not based on housing, are all good changes uh, that we should embrace. What's wrong is that the calculation on the jobs is, is, is false. I mean, it, it's just obvious to all of us that it is not um, uh, done with a realistic picture of job growth in uh, the rest of the South County. And so to me, when we do a letter, I really believe strongly that we should take an unselfish approach and say, look, we've been, we've been saying that jobs are the, pro are the problem all along. Um, in, you know, I hate saying that because it sounds very strange. Jobs are great, but they create um, a need for housing. That's the challenge. Um, and so the I think that because we've been we have known that for so long, it would be hypocritical of us to take a stand against that. But that being said, then we should get real information on what the job growth is going to be, and not uh, create a situation where um, uh, where we allow them to um, make the the crazy claim that there's going to be 9,861 new jobs in the city of Santa Barbara. Right, I don't know where those jobs are going to come from, and at the same time, the the county unincorporated incorporated areas, including UCSB, is only 382. Okay. Right, that's just not true, and so to me, we should have a truth-based response letter um, that the methodology should be based on jobs, but that they should be based on real projections of jobs. I also have a suggestion that if you really want to play hardball and um, and 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 get SBCAG to move, then you can just propose that that we um, allocate um, allocate uh, the Measure A funds on the basis of the arena allocation. And um, we, um, you know, I I know it's, but but it goes to Mr. White's point, which is what's going to happen. That MPOs actually are around all around California, and this is metropolitan planning organizations, for those that speak, planning speak, um, which SBCAG is ours, all around uh, California and America are the last place where one person does not equal one vote. And I'm not sure how that has continued to exist. Yeah. Right? It's an archaic voting methodology. 
and it's um, not only unfair on the RENA process, but it's particularly unfair with transportation allocation of dollars. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that's something that we need to address. And I hope it also makes us more aware of our need that, um, that really uh, we don't, we need to, to look, if we're looking at the future of regional cooperation, to me, I, I'm looking south, not north. Um, uh, in terms of um, in terms of embracing good good planning in terms of uh, the corridors that we need to address uh, in terms of uh, of transportation and housing to me regional cooperation needs to we need to face south and work with Ventura and Oxnard um, uh, because I think that that is a more manageable endeavor um, and that that means we have to look at, at JPAs, and I think one of those eventually is going to be transportation. I mean, to me, it's ridiculous mm -hmm. that most of the money for transportation gets generated here in the South and gets spent by the North. Most of the pe you know, by, by vote, we get less votes by population than the North does. Um, so whether you're talking about by votes or by money, um, it's generated here or should be generated here, but uh, it's controlled by the, by the north. Similarly, in, west, in Ventura County, it's the same situation from east to west. Uh, and so Western Ventura County shares a lot in common with us and has the same abuses by their NPO, and we should address that. Yeah. Okay, Dale. Okay. And then Charmaine. Okay, that's where yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to take it on faith. Um, I agree with many of the things that... Uh, Mickey Flax and Doss Williams and Bruce Bartlett have said, so I'm not going to repeat them. I personally, I think the whole RENA process is crazy. I don't, it's not that it's not a good method, it's a bad idea. Sacramento should not be telling us how many houses we need. They shouldn't be telling anybody outside of Sacramento how many houses they need. And I would like to see that become part of our legislative platform, not tinkering with the RENA process, getting rid of the RENA process. Um, I like the idea of adding more truth-based things <laughs> for now because that needs to be part of this will be a political game that we're going to be playing with the Board of Supervisors. That will be our next step. Our step after that, should we fail, will be the legal process. I'm sure, Mr. Wiley, I, you're, I'm sure you're thinking about that already. Um, and though I understand where Mr. Bartlett is coming from, uh, personally, I think this actually is. I mean, this is smart growth personified. The jobs are here. All the housing units are going to be here. We'll have nice 14-story condo towers with 200 square feet apiece for each unit. Um, for myself, since I don't believe in smart growth, since I believe that it has failed everywhere it's been tried, uh, I don't feel attached to that concept, so I can just reject it totally. But I understand how someone who believes in it would think, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, so I think we should be reconsidering that whole philosophy because this should be a reality check for that philosophy. This is what that philosophy results in. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Charmaine. Jacob. And then John. Yeah. Can you do it? Okay. Um, this, uh, is it working? This, this sort of looks like smart growth, but really it's a pretty clumsy um, mm -hmm. effort, but an effort that perhaps we should applaud, as Mr. Williams indicated, in that at least it's a change um, from some of the past planning efforts. Uh, but the, the the fact is this is, this is um, smart growth on steroids or some strange <laughs> mutation of it. This is not really smart growth. Um, and uh, having said that, the, um, the numbers are unrealistic, the data is unrealistic, and I think we have uh, heard some very good strategies for addressing that and appealing it. Um, but we do have to deal at some point with the numbers in creating our housing element, which is something that's on the table right now, mm -hmm. and how we deal, especially in the public realm, with the RENA allocation numbers and our housing element is one that I hope we, the city will think about. Um, and I, I, I'll thank Mr. DeForest for reminding us that sometimes the public can be rudely surprised uh, when projects show up as a fait accompli, mm -hmm. when even though they may have been in process for four or five years, all of a sudden 
here's this big project and uh, people react with uh, react primarily emotionally and um, good planning doesn't take place in that kind of atmosphere so I hope that um, as we uh, 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 formally object to these numbers and formally produce accurate data especially on jobs um, that we will keep the public informed of that process and that when it comes to the housing element uh, discussions that we are especially clear on exactly what the uh, the arena numbers are and why they have to be included in our plan um, and how that doesn't necessarily mean that 5,000 units are going to get built on Upper State Street uh, because that's where the blue squares are on the map. Mm -hmm. uh, so that okay. would be mine. Okay. Mr. Justice? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first a question, then a comment. Um, Liz, in, the, uh, in this new work that you've done, you uh, kind of alluded to uh, uh, com uh, housing build-out in the non-commercial zones in the five to 6,000 unit range how, in the commercial zones. How does this RENA number that we've been assigned of 4388 figure into that? Is part of that included in that residential build-out in commercial zones? Do we add most of this 4,300 on top of that if we were um, if we were to go with this number that, that we've been directed to use? How do the two processes give us a sense of where we're going in terms of uh, future numbers of housing in the city? Um, Commissioner Justice, uh, good question. Oh, very good question. Um, the the process um, that we used to identify the sites where additional residential could be built in commercial zones was very similar and consistent with the process that we identified sites in for our housing element. So the methodology is very consistent. Um, what concerns me is that we are just now tomorrow going, or today maybe, going public with this map and right. this analysis saying, look where all this housing could be built in our commercial zones. And during Plan Santa Barbara workshops mm -hmm. in the previous, previous phase, the community was, uh, spoke pretty strongly about a concern about the amount of, com amount of residential that's getting built in our commercial. Um, and so it's, it's like the big question for our planned Santa Barbara process. So I just um, think it would be, so it's, it's not, the 40,005 residential dwelling unit capacity is something that the community has, is familiar with and has been looking at and understands that that's the build out in our residential zones. We're just starting the dialogue tomorrow about what our build out should be in our commercial zones. So this would force our hand at, at saying what that number should be, and I think that would be most unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I'm, part of what I'm getting at is, is that this, this, this arena allocation is probably the, the most effective uh, public engagement tool for our <laughs> general plan update and the cheapest that we could have in, in, a, in a good long time, which means that we're going to have some very, very spirited discussions over the coming weeks and months. That piece aside, what, uh, what strikes me is that with the discussions amongst the nine cities and the five supervisors on a matter that is numbers-based, it's a single issue. It's how many, how many houses do you take as far as your allocation. There's winners and there's losers. That's the way it's defined. It's fixed pie. So somebody's going to feel left out as, as most of us in this room feel. Other people feel that they got a good deal and they want to stick with that. Uh, what it does is it clears the room if you just stay with, with one variable and people go to their corners. What needs to happen is that as I went through writing this report on the interregional partnership, like Mr. Bartlett, I found an incredible amount of hostility on the part of Western Ventura County and, and Northern Santa Barbara County about the South Coast, and we and that is coming home to roost with us uh, this week and this month. But what we need to do is engage the cities and the uh, and the county in a discussion about 
common problems, not just on one, one parallel, but on a, multi a multitude of issues, primarily open space, transportation, and housing are the big three. And San Diego passed their sales tax increase because they dealt with all three as a package. And they were the, one of the few counties in the state that got a sales tax increase extended or put in place. If we can't talk about at least two or preferably three variables as we revisit the issue of how we're going to deal with our infrastructure, our housing, our social structure, then we're not going to have a discussion. And the discussion needs to happen. So what I think we need to do besides our legal and planning and technical remedies is start to talk person to person to people who don't come to the SBCAG meetings, fellow council members, fellow community members, and start to talk about why we would want to talk about our problems and what are the benefits of trying to find a different way to deal with this. Because this way is not working very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the as optimistic as I can get about this process is mm -hmm. it's as this this outcome is going to motivate us to find out where we have uh, allies and how to engage as allies. Uh, it's interesting, though. Just a quick thought, Mr. Uh, Schneider. We, ha I, I talked about uh, Measure E at SBCAG because we're the only jurisdiction that controls the amount of square footage in commercial areas, and uh, that that. When Measure E went in, we had hoped to control the number of jobs and have the housing catch up. Little did we know that computers would no longer fill a room. They would be little tiny things, and people don't need as much space with their jobs and so on, so we got more jobs. But um, I just thought that was a worthy thing for us to do in trying to control the number of jobs, and it's still worthy to continue it from my point of view, but, but nobody seems to be at all that doesn't seem to be part of the mix, and I think it should be. And I don't know how else to co uh, control the number of jobs. I mean, so, anyway, it's, it's something to throw out there. Ms. Schneider. Mm -hmm. No, it's just, it's okay. just a... <laughs> I don't know what well, it is. I, I, the, 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 the word going through my head is absurd, although I do like Mr. DeForest's stupid and silly. I mean, I think that's... So, I, I do like that. Um, the process, the SBCAG, just to also go back to what Mr. White was saying, if you think about how SBCAG is, is set up, it's supposed to be a regional body, but frankly, everyone goes there thinking of their own different jurisdictional agenda and who, who put them there in the first place. And so the setup is broken. I mean, we, we've seen that with Measure D fights that we got to a point where we think maybe we're agreeing. Now, that still has to go to all the different city councils, including this one, to actually put it on the ballot. Do we allow talking to, as Mr. Justice was saying, about if we're going to look at housing and transportation and open space, that maybe the housing that's going to be dumped here, we get more of the transportation share, too. Do we, and does Measure A uh, coming to the city council, is that something that is now fair and equitable and regional? I mean, I think the city of Santa Barbara has been a very good player and wanting to be a regional player on so many activities, recreation being another one. The city of Santa Barbara is the recreational leader for the entire South Coast. We don't have to be. We choose to be because it's the right thing to do. And if we're not going to be getting the, ben the, rec the regional benefits from else elsewhere and that cooperation, we have to ask the question, how much of Mr. Nice Guy are we going to be anymore? And so I want to start with the approach of, okay, let's try to work something out and let's try to look at facts. And, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Francisco, to call this smart growth when the job numbers are completely wrong and completely topsy-turvy, um, you know, then this is not smart growth. It's uh, ridiculous. Um, so, so I, but, you know, that's a whole. Um, there is, and I'm going to bring up Portland, of all cities. Um, I know, you know, that, that Portland actually, the area, not just the city, but the whole area, in terms of another structure, I think it's the only one in the country. They have a metro, it's called Metro, mm -hmm. and it's either five or seven separately elected regional elected officials who their job is, they're not municipal city council members, they're not county board of supervisors. People have those also. 
but Metro covers, I think, a five-county area, including the city of Portland, and there are uh, districts. So I think it's a six six districts, and then one president of Metro for the entire area, and their job is looking at transportation, housing, um, trash, uh, recreation, and I think like the convention center or something like that. But true regional needs. And their job is to respond back to their constituents on those issues, not back to their individual cities or their representative of the county board of supervisors. And that's why you see a really fantastic um, transportation, interregional transportation section. And so if we really want to, as the governor says, blow up the boxes and start over, I mean, that's one way to look. But I, you know, I, I, I go back, Doss said to look at truth-based um, uh, analysis and let's look at some of the things that work and really look at the jail in North County no one's brought up yet and how many jobs is that going to really mean in terms of the allocation there. UCSB in Westmont and the Miramar, that was brought up before. Um, but, you know, and start there. But I, I really think we're going to have to consider if it's really going to be forced on us, what does that mean in terms of how we play in the rest of the, of the, uh, of the region? Are there other ways we can do that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And those are the Portland uh, Metro representatives are elected, right? They, Aren't they? They're I've forgotten. Elected. Yeah. It's separate from a Board of Supervisors race. Yeah. It's separate from the mayor and councils of the different cities. They represent a regional mm -hmm. piece that some of it covers part of an urban area, part of a suburban area, and part of a rural area. The point being that then they have to look at these issues on a regional basis, and their and yeah. their constituents look to them for those issues only on a regional basis. Well, but it would be a good start for SBK to consider themselves a planning body. And I just okay, okay. Uh, do you want us to talk about whether we do it by letter or whatever? It seems to me we we're going to need to. We have to look into the appeal process a little bit more. And and I didn't hear anybody saying, "Oh no, let's not. Let's just roll over and play dead." Yes, yeah, so this, <laughs> this really good information and the like okay. I said the. Uh, tomorrow, the draft mm -hmm. regional housing needs plan will get posted on the SBCAG uh, website, and we'll start drafting comment letter based on what we heard today. Okay. And I believe we'll go to the planning commission and then to the council and then to SBCAG for okay. the next 60 days. Madam okay. Mayor, if I could just ask yes, a little more ahead. on that. So, um, I, I mean, I can see I could see a, a, a jurisdiction like ours just um, uh, reacting and saying no. You know, I mean, just no, and you got, you know, and leaving it up to them to somehow work it out. But it sounds like we have some pretty good ideas, at least in today's discussion, mm -hmm. of what would be plausible, uh, rational, um, uh, make sense on the ground, meet the uh, our needs, but also the needs of our part of our of our. I'll call them partners for, <laughs> hopefully that's how it will turn out. But 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 our, but the adjoining jurisdictions in the county. So. Uh, it would seem to me that, that for us to make a counter proposal of some sort that ha or some put something back into it in terms of what we see as an appropriate way to approach this particular uh, allocation and future ones would be it would be a, a part of what we're trying to communicate am I, am I correct in that yeah. uh, absolutely mm -hmm. yes. okay I just wanted to be sure because it's mm -hmm. a it, we could go the other way and just kind of say absolutely no way over our dead body kind of thing but then we might just end up dead you know <laughs> and maybe we could actually <laughs> come up with something that could be better out of this yeah and, uh, I do know that there's some other some of the jurisdictions inland have had some conversations. They they saw what was going on and they they were very uncomfortable with this as well. I mean, some of the key leaders up there. I I don't know and not voting members unfortunately, but members of staffs and such. And I think that it's really important that um, that what we put forward is something that those who are maybe cooler heads in this whole process can grasp onto and recognize the value for them in the future too. They don't want to be one, the recipients one day or another of a willy nilly process like this. Thank you. What we heard earlier about what the rationale was behind this, that the county is their job is to be the social safety net of um, for residents and so not about housing. 
And I would agree with that if they weren't also looking at making amazing cuts in all those various places without looking at where the revenue source is coming in. And frankly, property tax is a revenue source for the county. So, you know, if the housing's not going to go there, which means there's going to be potentially no property tax there, and yet they're having cuts to the very services they claim is their core mission, I think there's a disconnect there in that mm -hmm. logic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good point. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. I know we kept you over, but I appreciate it. It's good discussion. Great. Five minutes is good. Okay, thank you. <laughs>